so as the text-based introduction noted, this week is going to be chopped up a little bit because the recordings that we have available to us are ones from when the course was offered over a 15-week period. And as you know, we are completing the course over a 10-week period. So because they had 50% more time to cover the material, they sequenced the readings slightly differently than what we've had to sequence them because we're working with two-thirds of the time that they had to complete the course. So this first lecture that you have here is going to be one that focuses up on chapters 7, 13, and 16 of the Bronson et al. textbook. And it'll be chopped up a little bit as we go through because uh, Dr. Clavel Hall goes and discusses the first three or four slides and then based upon a question from the students actually moves ahead to one of the slides later in the particular session and once she finishes talking about that they've run up against time again based upon the initial conversation they had before the formal lecture began. So one of the things you'll have is you'll have some of Dr. Clavel Hall's lecture uh, available to you and then I will come in and fill in some of the pieces in the middle and then she'll come back again where she covers that material that she jumped ahead to cover and then I'll conclude it out on the end. The other thing that I will apologize for up front, um, this recording in particular, the sound quality isn't that good in it. Unfortunately, it appears that more than one student left their mics on during the session, so you'll hear a high-pitched uh, noise that uh, appears essentially keeps going throughout the session and that's essentially the feedback that's occurring because people have left their mics and speakers on as Dr. Clavel Hall is presenting and I've tried to minimize it as much as I can playing with the specifics in the video editing but unfortunately I can't get rid of it all and I do apologize about that up front. So with that I will turn it over to Dr. Clavel Hall. So as we look at uh, as we're looking at the design uh, and analysis things, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, design for dissemination and uh, looking at implementation designs as well as looking at a bit of fidelity and some case studies. I want to ask you from your reading, did you notice anything? Uh, distinctive about the approach to dissemination compared to the approach to implementation. Did anything come to mind or seem like it was uh, interesting to you between dissemination and implementation? Is there a difference? One thing that we're going to look at is as we go forward, Know that we've been looking at uh, this blue highway throughout the course. I want to point out a couple of things. As you see the T3, the dissemination research, and the implementation research, they are part of the translation process. What we're going to point out is implementation is more fully developed in research and dissemination. They have a, a bit more terminology, they have a bit more taxonomy, it's a little more established. Okay? That's one thing. As we go forward, put a note on this, when we talk about binge research, uh, we're talking about ideal situations the laboratory where things are controlled. We're talking about efficacy studies. That's what goes on more at this end, at bench research. In general, when you move over to clinical practice, you're looking more at real world circumstances. Do you remember the term real world in some of your readings when things mm -hmm. are implemented in the real world or interventions in the real world. It's more uncontrolled situations. And 
uh, effectiveness studies go on more over here in the real world, okay? So I just want to point those things out as uh, things to look out for as we look at this uh, diagram once more. So then, we move forward. Do you remember seeing this diagram in your book, Brownson? And if you, I would say, as we talk about, I told you the efficacy studies were which phase of the, uh, of the Blue Highway? Uh-huh, we're about the binge of T1, T0 area, that's mm -hmm. efficacy studies. And then I said the effectiveness study, which part of the roadmap that's going to be more around T4, okay? And talking about the real world type of uh, studies. That's what you're looking at. And what we're going to be looking at a lot more in this part of our study is looking at how how to look at studies effectiveness studies and the parts of them that we're going to be concerned with here. and they talked about a little bit in your book when they talk about the exploratory phase we're talking more about looking at who is your audience think about your project that you may be doing when you're doing an evidence-based project, when researchers are doing research, they're looking at their audience. Uh, who are they trying to reach? Who are they trying to impact outcomes with? Who is going to uh, receive the intervention that you are planning to do? Those are some of the things you're looking at with exploration. When you're looking at adoption, you're looking at modifying or slightly tailoring or changing the, or the original project or the original innovation a little bit to fit the needs of your particular audience. And you will be looking, we're going to talk a bit about fidelity versus adaptation. What are we talking about in this diagram of interventional lifestyle, what are we talking about when we mention the implementation stage? Think of your project. What's going on during implementation? Yes, implementation is the actual doing of it, as Kyle described, and somebody said the strategies. It's the strategies that help you decide how you're going to actually do it. It's carrying out the project. And I want to go back to what Suzanne said. I think she was saying uh, going from general to specific knowledge. That is inductive approach compared to deductive approach. That's the, the way of the, the type of... Um, type of strategy you're going to begin to use. Uh, is it um, inductive, meaning you're going to start from knowledge you already have and, and apply it to something general or vice versa? Start from something general and try and apply it to something specific. So, but this implementation stage here for DNI, we're talking about walking through the steps of actually doing the project, which is based upon your strategies that you develop and based upon your theories and frameworks and models that you've chosen for your project to show people how you're going to walk through. That makes sense? So we're there. So now we're at sustainment. What is sustainment? Still thinking about your project, a project. What is sustainment? Uh, so you're right, sustainment, you want to see if it's stuck, that's one part, Did it, can it continue some of the major factors about sustainability, especially with uh, projects, is once you've started the project and pull out the major funders and the major, the major implementers, Mm -hmm. Can the project continue? But with sustainability, I want you to take uh, note that you need to remember scaling up. So not just did it stick, 
Uh, I do this project in the intensive care unit, early mobility. We're getting people um, mobile uh, went, uh, eight hours earlier now. Not only can, are we going to continue that when I pull Kyle, the, uh, the <laughs> implementer, out, and when we pull out the extra funding for paying for the extra nurses, not only can it continue, can we move it to the cardiac unit now? And that is something that is unique to your DNP project as an evidence-based project. If it were a quality improvement project, as in a master's program, you're doing that in a microsystem, doing it in one unit-based place where you have interface with the patient. However, in your DNP project, you're looking for sustainability, not just with the project in the unit that you started it on, but is it sticking well enough and consistently enough to scale it up to other areas? You're looking at system scaling up in a DMP project, okay? And I do want to say this before we go. It was at this stage that Dr. Clavel Hall actually jumped ahead in the slide deck to address some of the questions that students were having that I edited out of the video. So I'm going to pick it up here for a few slides. Um, one of the things that it's important to sort of take away from chapter seven in particular, if you look at pages 109 and 110, you'll see that table seven one here has these different domains that uh, you need to be aware of when it comes to the principles for designing dissemination research. So as you're looking through the three specific domains, you'll notice that each one has a subdomain, and then under each of those subdomains, there's a series of sample actions. Now these actions, or these samples I should say, aren't exclusive. So there are other things that you could have for each of these different subdomains. But it's designed to give you a sense of the different types of things that you can do. As you start designing your own translational research project, one of the things that you want to keep in mind is that you want to address multiple domains as you're looking at this and specifically as you're looking at the different subdomains you can see some of the steps that you're going to want to undertake as you begin to design your own study. Now as you proceed through chapter 7 you'll note that um, the rest of the chapter really is divided into sort of three separate sections. There's one there on the um, environmental initiatives and it's an active transport one and then on the following page you'll see that there's a workplace sitting reduction initiative and then the final one is a high-risk group and what those essentially are are examples or for lack of a better word, illustrative cases that you should review because one of the things that you should be able to see as you're reviewing those three examples that are there, you should be able to see many of the subdomains and sample actions that are listed in Table 7.1 as you're reviewing each of those um, each of those examples that are there, each of those uh, cases that are there. And if you didn't notice that as you were reviewing it initially, you want to go back and just sort of skim through those five or six pages with the table sort of with your finger or thumb sort of in the page that has the table so you can flip back and forth to make sure that you see the systematic way in which this is being done as you're looking at each of these. So moving along, looking at chapter 13, I'm only going to briefly mention these, and there's only a couple of slides here that I really want to focus upon, because one of the things that I discovered as I was reviewing former versions of the class is that Dr. Clavo Hall had actually recorded a lecture specifically on chapter 13, or at least large portions of it. So that would have been two years ago, and I've included that 
lecture as one of the ones to review for this week. So you'll see it's not the next video in the sequence, but it's the third video in the sequence. So um, some of the things to keep in mind, though, is as you're looking through this, there are specific strategies that you would want to undertake in order to go about doing an a project that's more focused upon implementation and they start to get into that on pages 203 and continue really throughout most of up until 207 as you're going through the book and as you're looking at whether or not you are focused upon a dissemination or an implementation outcome and Dr. Clavel Hall in that third lecture in the sequence does a really good job of going through and differentiating between the two types of outcomes. But these are the types of things that would fall under the realm of implementation outcomes. So if these are your goals for your research project, then these are the things Then you are more focused upon uh, an implementation outcome as opposed to a dissemination outcome. Now, I want to turn your attention to something in the textbook where uh, I'll be honest with you and say that this is one of the areas of research in general where those in the medical field differ quite a lot from those in other fields. So starting on page 207, Bronson et al. go into a couple of sections there that look at this idea of randomized control trials. Um, if you're not familiar with the term and if you didn't get it from the reading, essentially this is the way in which the vast majority of medical research is done. And what happens is people are randomly assigned to either the treatment slash intervention or to the control. And if you have a large enough sample of people that are randomly assigned to one or the other, then you should be able to compare the outcomes of the people that were getting the treatment or involved in the intervention compared against those that were in the control group. And if there's a statistically significant difference, the belief is that the differences were caused by the treatment or by the intervention. So that's essentially the basic premise of a randomized control trial. Now, one of the things that you will see in the fourth video for the session six content is a specific video that looks at randomized control trials and begins to test this belief of being the gold standard of design. One of the things that I will tell you that in terms from a terminology perspective that it's important to note, uh, it's important to know the, the difference between efficacy trials and effectiveness trials. Essentially, efficacy trials are those that we would do more in a laboratory type setting. Uh, as you can see from the slide here, it says under optimal conditions, whereas effectiveness trials are ones that we would do in the field. So these are the ones that would be done, as the slide indicates, under real world conditions. To its credit, I have to say that the, the Bronson and All textbook does do a little bit of this idea of questioning or the term they use is rethinking whether or not randomized control trials are the best way of doing things. Um, they don't look at it or question it from a methodological perspective, which you'll see happens in the fourth video in the content for this particular session. Uh, they question it based upon a variety of, I would say, real-world issues. So this idea of underserved populations or under-resourced settings, uh, whether or not a intervention can be universal across multiple contexts or, as they say, at a national level, and whether or not the specific peculiarities of the social and organizational elements that are specific to an individual environment or context, uh, whether or not those things play a role. And there are also ethical issues to consider as well. For example, 
And this is not something that we bring up in that fourth video, but it is something that you would want to ask yourself. If you have something, a, a, a treatment or an intervention that has shown under certain circumstances to be successful, to help somebody treat a particular disease, is it really ethical to give to have the person involved in a research subject a research study where they believe they may be getting the treatment and they may be getting better but in reality they're just getting saline or some other control item um, you know is it really ethical for us to essentially be testing medical interventions on people that could actually be gaining benefit from these things if they weren't part of the control group or alternately folks that might end up getting adverse side effects or adverse consequences because they are part of the treatment group. It is part of the medical process, but it does raise an ethical question that I think it would be important for us to understand and that it would, it's important that we don't exclude that consideration as part of our consideration of randomized control trials. I will end in saying, or at least end the portion of this lecture focused upon randomized control trials by saying that it is the vast majority of medical research is focused upon randomized control trials. That is the main one. Although there are other designs that could be used. And if you look at page 208, you'll see that actually 208 and 209 continuing on into the first part of 210, you'll see that uh, Bronson et al. go through and talk about three other potential models that could be used as opposed to randomized control trials. And I think these are ones to seriously consider as you're thinking about your own translational research project. Bronson et al. finished chapter 13 with a consideration of some of the methodological issues that uh, you need to be aware of or that you should consider. Um, there are essentially four subsections that begin on page 214, uh, continuing on to page 216, and they essentially align with each of the four points that you see here. Essentially, each of these four points are a good five to eight word summary of what you'll find in those sections. Finally, one of the things to, I guess, underscore as you're looking through not just chapter 13 here, but really all of the readings that we've been looking at both to date and upcoming is this idea of systems thinking, or as the slide says here, and for that matter, as they start on page 216 in the Bronson et al. textbook, this idea of system science. The whole purpose for doing or approaching translational research and evidence-based practice in the manner in which we're doing it is to ensure that we have a specific system in place. And that system should be selected, that model or framework should be selected on the basis of its fit to the particular context and the type of study that we are looking to undertake. And by having that sort of system, that model, that framework, it allows us to approach the particular um, process that we undertake with a level of fidelity that would allow it to be replicated by others and that would give us the confidence that what it is that we're finding in terms of outcomes is due to what it is we're doing and not due to some mistake or error or inconsistency in the process that we're undertaking. Now, you'll notice I mentioned fidelity as I was talking about that, and this is actually the point where Dr. Clavel Hall jumps ahead and picks up on this theme of fidelity uh, based upon one of the students' earlier questions. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Clavel Hall here for a little bit. Fidelity, 
Fidelity is going to be, go ahead and skip to that slide. I know we're going to have to come back to some of these. Uh, but, um, fidelity is, you have absolute fidelity, which is the extent to which the intervention was delivered as planned. That means that original plan, say, uh, you took uh, the research of uh, hand washing from, from Clavo and she put up the protocol. Well, now, uh, Jenny is going to be instituting it on another unit. How much tweaking do I have to do to change it to make it work on this new unit? Uh, and when it cannot maintain absolute fidelity, meaning I cannot apply it exactly the way Clavo wrote it up as she did it in her study, well, I'll lose the absolute fidelity, but that's not a bad thing because we know that different settings and different populations are likely to need some adjusting. It's, that's where we get to adaptation and adopting, if we get to adaptation, is changing what you need to change to make the core elements of the project work for a new population or a new setting. So we will be talking about the tension between adaptation and fidelity. So fidelity is a world of its own that is very important that we'll talk about more, but it's going to be a balance. And the big thing is how much can you maintain to the core elements, okay? I'm going to stop us here right now for this today. And, and I want you to think about uh, projects that you may be interested in doing and think about how this may fit. Uh, because you're going to run into these things as your project unfolds. So that was about where Dr. Clavel Hall concluded that particular lecture. They continued on with some discussion of the individual projects that they were working on at that stage. However, I'd like to pick it up here and finish out the slide deck uh, briefly. So the remaining slides that are in here obviously are focused upon Chapter 16 of the Bronson et al. textbook, which was the chapter that focused specifically upon fidelity. One of the things that I'd like to underscore as you are sort of looking through Chapter 16, if you look at the figure that is on the bottom of page 268, figure 16.1, You'll see a chart there that focuses upon the factors that influence fidelity. And one of the things that you will note is the importance of all of these micro, meso, and macro factors that we've been looking at as we've been thinking about this notion of systems thinking as we uh, approach our evidence-based research projects or our translational research projects. Now, one of the reasons why we want to focus upon the fidelity of implementation when it comes to the specific model or the specific uh, framework that we have chosen is because we want to try to maintain a degree of validity of the research. So essentially, we want to conduct the research in such a way that it will both be something that somebody else could come in next year, next week, next month, and replicate and come up with roughly the same findings, but also the fact that what it is that we're doing follows a accepted process or an accepted set of practices. Uh, so those are the two aspects of validity that you want to focus upon as you are looking at this. And there are a number of things that can influence the level of fidelity that you are able to undertake as you move through your project. 
Some of these things will be just your own characteristics and things that you're either good at or not so good at. Things that you understand well or don't understand quite as well. Uh, things that you're comfortable in doing as opposed to things that you're not as comfortable doing. One of the important things in being a researcher, even if it is a practitioner-focused researcher, is the ability to recognize these particular characteristics and to try to mitigate those things so that they don't end up influencing the level of fidelity in which you're able to undertake your particular intervention, your particular evidence-based practice. Um, the intervention itself, obviously, the ability to do things the exact way in which they were done based upon the research that you're using to inform your evidence-based practice is going to be an important thing. If you don't have access to all of the educational materials that they used and you have to create your own, that in and of itself is going to influence the fidelity of implementation how close your organization or your population is in comparison to the one that was in the research in which you determined this evidence-based practice from is also going to influence the ability for you to have a higher or lower level of fidelity to the original one. Um, one of the things that we always struggle with as researchers, particularly as beginning researchers, is this idea of adaptation. It's okay to adapt something to fit the differences between the way in which the research was originally done and the way in which you're doing it. There are a number of things that we just talked about that will influence your ability to be able to do the research with a high level of fidelity and if the inability to do it with a high level of fidelity jeopardizes the validity of the research then you want to be a little bit flexible as an example and it's a very basic example say the study was originally done in my home province of Newfoundland Canada where everybody speaks English and the evidence-based practice that you are looking to implement here was based upon research that came out of my home province back in Canada. However, when you look at your particular population, there's a lot of languages that are spoken here that aren't English. And in many cases, while people can work in English, they have a functional understanding of English, Many of our patients don't, and even those that do, their level of comprehension and their ability to fully understand what it is they're doing in a foreign tongue is different than what it would be in their native language. So one thing that you might decide to adapt between that evidence-based practice that occurred back in my home province of Newfoundland and something that you would do here in an environment, you know, Northern California, might be to have various translations of the materials available or the data collection instruments that you're using to determine whether or not your evidence-based practice had similar outcomes. And that's an ability to be flexible without jeopardizing the internal validity or the external validity of your study. So when you're considering this idea of how flexible should I be, should I adapt things, um, should I change things or modify, revise things, the questions that you always want to focus upon are whether or not it will jeopardize the internal or the external validity of the study. And as you get further along in your doctoral process, uh, particularly in your DNP project courses, you'll spend more time actually looking at the issues of internal and external validity as well as reliability uh, so that you'll be able to implement an evidence-based practice project or a translational research project that addresses those issues. So to summarize these three chapters, the first thing is that 
Designing for dissemination is an expanding approach for preventing and treating chronic diseases. So when you're looking back into Chapter 7, that's one of the overarching themes that you want to take with you. Um, you'll notice that in the Chapter 13 standalone lecture that comes up uh, as the third lecture in the sequence for this session's content spends a lot of time looking at the differences between dissemination outcomes or dissemination projects and implementation projects or implementation outcomes. And one of the things that the students in that particular semester noted about the treatment of those two in the textbook was the fact that there seemed to be a lot more information about the implementation ones. So one of the things that you want to take away from the readings here is that while dissemination outcomes and dissemination projects receive less attention in the text, they are an expanding area. The second thing that you want to take away from the readings this week is the fact that dissemination and implementation research requires either randomized control trials or methodologically valid and reliable alternatives to randomized control trials. And it's that latter that I think is becoming more and more important within medical research as the field begins to expand outward and look beyond the medical profession. Finally, it's important to take away from this week's materials the struggle it is to try to balance the desire to implement something with a high level of fidelity while at the same time being able to adapt it to the specific context or setting or environment that you're working in while still hoping to achieve outcomes that are reliable and valid from your evidence-based research project or your translational research project. So that's it for the overview of these three chapters. As I mentioned in the beginning, the focus upon chapter 10, which was one of the other readings, comes up in the next video in the content, so be sure to look at that one next.